Well, our warmest greetings to all of you today as you've come for this second of our two worship services this morning. Special welcome to our guests who are with us and to you who are online. Thank you for viewing the service today from a distance, but you're a part of our, our worship as well. Uh, we're going to get a little better acquainted inside this room, so be sure you've met someone now as you stand to find uh, the hand of somebody you've not known before and give a nice warm welcome. Thanks very much. You may be seated. Joining us today are families with children that they are doing their best to keep under control and, and, and to rear as they long to do as families. We are grateful for each one. We call this our child dedication service. In many ways, it's a parent dedication. Children are so young, they'll not even remember this, but they do help move me along with their responses on occasion. So glad to have each one with us. This has its roots in uh, 1 Samuel, where Hannah uh, brought her son to Eli the priest and gave her son to the Lord and the Lord's work. And uh, Hannah had been barren and the Lord gave her a, a child. And she said, if you will do that for me, I will give him to you. And she dedicated him to the Lord. We believe that all children are the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. How happy is the one who has his quiver full of them. Grateful for those the Lord entrusts to us. Quivers are different sizes, by the way. Sometimes you think yours is full and you have three more children later on. And the quiver becomes increasingly more full. However many, it's not the number, it's the commitment of the parents to the responsibility of rearing children God's way. Not an easy task in the culture in which we live. So always remember that these are people we're to pray for regularly. They are involved in the task of preparing their little ones to become our future as a nation. By the way, if you're among the godparents or the grandparents of those who are held in arms or standing beside parents. Would you stand and let us see you today? There you are. We've got a few of you. Welcome. So glad you're here and we thank you for the strategic role you fill in the lives of your, of your uh, children, grandchildren, the family. Now, if I could have the parents turn to face me, please. We commend you for your involvement in the lives of these you're rearing. We who have reared our family know something of what you're going through. And so we today commit ourselves to pray for you and to remember you and your involvement with your child or children. Today I have four questions to ask each of you. Simple answer is I do when you hear the question. 
First, do you testify today that you have personally come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own Savior? Good. Do you desire that your home be a place where the Word of God is honored and where the name of God is lifted up and Christ is magnified? Is that your desire? Do you desire that today? Do you uh, therefore give your child to the Lord irrevocably, trusting the Lord to guide in his or her life so that he or she will someday come to know Christ as you do? Do you therefore promise before God that you will give of your time and attention to prepare your child with the right kind of home life that will create a thirst for spiritual things as long as the child is under your roof. Before I pray today, we want to sing together a song that we'd like the congregation to join in with. You'll see the words on the screen, and we'll sing along with these parents these words for children in the home. Please stand for this prayer of dedication. <laughs> Our Father, we thank you that these children are yours and they are on loan to these parents for a relatively brief period of time. Give wisdom, give guidance, make it clear to these parents how their child has been prepared by you with a particular and unique makeup, set of bents, love for certain areas of life that they can cultivate and develop. Give these parents patience so that they can be guided by you in the raising of these children. We pray for the children's protection that you would give them safety on their journey toward adulthood. 
We commit each one to you, dedicate each one to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. All the people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have certificates today for these families. First, for Emily Hobson Wang and for James Hobson Wang. And then for uh, Reese Okarwadadu. For Rowan Slade, Madison Grace, and Elijah Michael Mueller. Emily Schuyler and Micah David Kosidar. For writer Bren Ethel. And Mila Zoe Bartlett. Our time also to thank Dave Carl uh, for his work among our early childhood ministry and Heather as well. Thank you for both of you in your ministry to our children. <laughs> Welcome back, Don. We're so glad you're here to guide us through the music of the morning. We missed you. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. No place like Stonebriar on a Sunday morning. It really is. This is true. Uh, yeah, it is. <sighs> Two weeks ago, I was in my favorite building in all the world. That's St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Right. And you've been there. It's a gorgeous place. But I bet they didn't have a string quartet. <laughs> they didn't have a choir. Either. <laughs> and they didn't have Chuck Swindoll either. <laughs> I've often called... <laughs> Chuck, the, the Pope of the evangelical world. <laughs> I think it's a fair thing to say. <laughs> the choir's call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 57. Starts out a little strange that the psalmist is talking to himself. Now, we normally think oddly of someone who continually talks to himself, but the, the psalmist is talking to himself. Perhaps he's tired, perhaps he's had a bad day. But he says this, awake my soul and sing. He's talking to himself. He says, whatever this, this, this slumber is in that I'm in emotionally or physically, awake my soul and sing the greatness of the Lord. He commands his soul to sing. And uh, so uh, listen attentively. It's a great song. It, and then David lists all the different things that we have to give thanks for and to praise. So the choir will sing, and then I'll stand you, and you'll join us in singing one of the great hymns of our faith. Thank you. Oh. 
now are those words that I quoted earlier from the Psalmist David. Let's say together aloud, Psalm 57. Let me remind you, this is the word of the Lord that we speak. My heart is confident in you, O God. My heart is confident. No wonder I'm afraid. My heart is confident. Yes, my heart is confident. Wake up, my heart. Wake up. of our hearts, with our voices, with our singing, even with the meditations of our hearts, we give you great praise. I pray that you would accept our praise as our sacrifice of love to you. We give you great honor this day and in this hour. In your name we pray, amen. Most people are familiar with the New Testament in the scriptures, but the old is not as familiar to most. It's easy to overlook the fact that the Old Testament is in divisions. We find the law 
in the first five books of the Bible, and then there are books of history, then there are books of poetry, and finally, books of prophecy. Among the prophetic books, there are four major prophets who write. They are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They're called major because their writings are longer, not more significant than the minor, but they are greater in volume than the minor prophets. And then there are 12 minor prophets that begin with Hosea and take us to Malachi. They are shorter in size, but equally significant. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, regardless of where you may turn in the Bible. I'm involved in a, a series that's unusual in the Minor Prophets, and we'll just realize how unusual they are because this very first one we're looking at somewhat in depth is a most unusual book. If you haven't turned yet, please turn to Hosea and find chapter one. I'll read some excerpts from four different chapters here in this 14 chapter book. Brief excerpts, but it'll give you sort of a thumbnail sketch of the book itself. Hosea writes of his experience in the first three chapters and then of Israel's idolatry and unfaithfulness in the last 11 chapters. So I want to read for you beginning at chapter 1. Once you find your place, please stand with me for the reading of the scriptures and remain standing for prayer. Hosea begins, The Lord gave this message to Hosea, son of Miri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joahash, was king of Israel. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go, and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Biblaim, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And the Lord said, name the child Jezreel, for I'm about to punish King Jehu's dynasty to avenge the murder he committed at Jezreel. In fact, I will bring an end to Israel's independence. I will break its military power in the Jezreel Valley. Now turn to chapter three with me. The first couple of three verses read, then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So, I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. Now move a distance ahead to chapter 11, and I'll begin reading at verse 1. 
Hosea 11, 1. Now the Lord speaks to the nation. When Israel was a child, I loved him. I called my son out of Egypt, but the more I called to him, the farther he moved from me, offering sacrifices to the images of Baal and burning incense to idols. I myself taught Israel how to walk, leading him along by the hand. But he doesn't know or even care that it was I who took care of him. Now finally, chapter 14, the first two verses. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. Like I said, a most unusual book with a very unusual message given to Hosea. I thought as I was studying the book of Hosea, I'm so glad he said it to Hosea and not to me. <laughs> so grateful that the Lord chooses those for these assignments as he chooses. So grateful for his plan, as mysterious as it is. Now is our opportunity to give to the Lord and to return to him from what he has given to us. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. May our giving honor him this day. Bow with me, will you? Our Father, you own it all, everything we are and everything we have and all things about us have been created for you and for your glory. We have not cared for them as we should, and we realize often that we have not taken care of the things you have created. We have not been faithful stewards. We bring before you our hearts of repentance and we pray that you will hear us as we call upon you today. Thank you for your grace that you love us with an everlasting love. Nothing we can do could cause you to love us more or to love us less. Thank you for loving us in all our needs. We give you praise, Father, for your word which lives and abides forever. May we remember as we live our days that we are to align ourselves to its truths and adjust ourselves to what you have written rather than to our times. Guard us against allowing this world to squeeze us into its mold so that we might walk with you and in concert with your plan. We pray for those today who suffer, and we ask that you would bring hope and healing and recovery for them by your will and by your grace. We pray for those who minister to them, that you will give them strength and patience, wisdom and guidance. We thank you for our church, for the lighthouse it is in this community. May we live in such a way that the salt is spread and the light shines brightly for your greater glory. Now these gifts are yours, our Father, which we return to you and we do so with great gratitude for Christ who paid it all all to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but he
he, in his death, washed it white as snow. How grateful we are for our Savior, for his death on our behalf. We dedicate this offering to you for your glory. In his great name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Most everyone I know loves stories, and many of us love great love stories. Well, if they are stories about real love, true love, which is hard to find, because true love stories these days are rare. One painfully honest author writes this. We live in a world awash in love stories, but most of them are lies. They're not love stories at all. They're lust stories. They are sex fantasy stories, domination stories. 
From the cradle, we are fed on lies about love. This would be bad enough if only, if it only messed up human relationships, man and woman, parent and child, friend and friend. But it also messes up God relationships. The huge mountainous reality of all existence is that God is love and that God loves the world. And so it's necessary that we clarify the meaning of true love. Isn't it interesting? We use the word often, but we rarely take time to define it or even to think through an adequate definition of real love. So I've worked on that for a while and come up with my own definition, if you will, of true love. I believe it is an intense affection for another. It is a deep tenderness, a profound and lengthy commitment towards someone else. True love always seeks the highest good of the other person even though the other person may not deserve it or may not even want it. You see, love that is true love isn't there because of what it gets out of it, but because of what it is able to give to the other person. That's why we say it is so rare this, in these days, because so much about our day is narcissistic. It's about us. It's about me. What I can benefit from this, or what makes me feel better or important. In the scriptures, you come across mainly true love. But every once in a while, you find a love that is not true. It is a faithless relationship, which brings us to the book of Hosea. I'll tell you, having spent weeks on it, I can say it is one of the most unusual books in all the Bible, perhaps in all of literature. Here is this tender man who is a prophet called to minister to a nation that is anything but tender. You see, when Solomon, toward the end of his life, fell into the trap of all the foreign wives and concubines that entered his world. He left a relationship with God. Not only that, he left his kingdom in shambles. It was in such a need that it divided into two sections. A northern kingdom called Israel in the years ahead, and a southern kingdom called Judah. And there were kings in the north, and there were kings in the south. Ten tribes went to the north. Two tribes went into the south. Not one of the kings that reigned in the north was a godly king. Not one. So the people following the 
example of their king, became godless. They followed other gods, not the God who had given them existence, the God of Israel. In the South, there were a few godly kings, but not that many. Anyway, Hosea is ministering to this body of people who are unfaithful to the God who gave them life. What a calling. How would God reach a people like this? Well, it may surprise you if you're not familiar with Hosea to see that he would use a man to be a model of himself, God, who would fall in love with a woman who would be a model of the nation, Israel. Hosea is the prophet, Gomer is the wife. He has the heart of, of the Lord. He's tender, he's caring, he's loving, he's reaching out. He's longing for this nation to turn to the Lord. And the Lord says, I want you to model that in your marriage as you reach out to one who has no interest in spiritual things. Gomer has the heart and the desires of a woman of the street. And Hosea's responsibility given by God is to love her unconditionally, just as the Lord loved Israel unconditionally. All this brings us to the story itself. Israel has drifted far from the Lord. Though they were unfaithful, though they worshiped other idols, God loved them and continued to reach out to them. Tragically, not only did the people turn away from God, their priests did as well. And so the priests are weak and false representatives of the message of God. The people became even weaker. So the Lord sent a prophet. Hosea is the prophet. The prophet Hosea comes to warn them and he does so, get this, as a living example, a living illustration of the Lord reaching out to the nation Israel, who have turned to the gods of Baal and the cult worship, which included the sex slaves that were a part of the worship. The first three chapters of, Isaac, of uh, Hosea are biographical and symbolical in nature. They are narrative. They're hard to read in the sense that they break your heart when you put yourself in, in Hosea's place. But they are relatively easy to read because it goes from sentence to sentence and paragraph to paragraph telling a story, a love story of a man whose heart has been broken by a wife who spurns his love. And he is directed not only to love her, tender man that he was, but to marry her again, even though she had left his home, left the marriage, and taken to the street to live the life of a prostitute. She is anything but a woman of God. She has the soul and the desires of a woman of the street. Hosea continues to reach out to her just as God reached out to Israel. 
These three chapters provide us with the perfect example of the Lord's faithfulness to his people in spite of the people's response. And you know what, uh, before we start feeling a little smug about it all, take a look at your own life. It's been far from perfect, hasn't it? So is mine. But there wasn't a day in our existence that the Lord did not love us. It would have been impossible to be so bad that the Lord finally said to us, I stopped loving you. Nope, that would never happen. His love is unconditional. Unconditional. Now the last 11 chapters of Hosea, trust me, are disjointed. The paragraphs sort of clash together. The chapters are difficult to read because Hosea writes them in his emotional state as a husband who has been betrayed, who has lost his wife to the streets and is to carry on as a prophet of God. What a calling. How difficult. Kyle Yates writes, the author, Hosea, did not arrange these 11 paragraphs in logical order, meaning the last 11 in the book. He was so deeply stirred by his great emotions that he jumped from one great idea to another with very little regard for order. The book is little more than a succession of sobs. Isn't that a good way to put it? Doesn't that describe the heart of the faithful partner in a marriage whose husband or whose wife has chosen to leave that husband or wife for another person or other people? You remain there with the children, faithfully attending to their needs, doing your best to carry on, and your life is often a succession of sobs. You cry yourself to sleep. You find yourself in tears shortly after awakening. Your heart broken over your lot in this marriage, and there doesn't seem to be anything you can do to bring them back. Strangely, in many cases, you continue to love that person as Hosea continued to love Gomer. And so Yates continues, even though these chapters are so disconnected, one does not have difficulty understanding the great throbbing purpose of Hosea's soul. He longs to win this nation back to God when the nation wants nothing to do with the God who gave them breath in their lungs. You see, on top of all of this concern, he has his own personal struggles at home with a heartbreaking relationship with Gomer. So we enter into this book with an understanding that this is a man who has a troubled soul. It is a dark domestic tragedy, this story. To be honest with you, it doesn't end well. The nation falls to Assyria and Hear this, as they move away from God, they are obliterated. They're called by some theologians, the lost tribes of Israel. Now the southern tribes led ultimately to the dynasty of David and on leading 
into the messianic line from which Christ came. But the tribes of the north fell first to Assyria and ultimately, if you will, virtually disintegrated. They were shattered because of their distance from the living God, never returning to him. Let me take up this tragic story in chapter 3 with you. So turn in your Bibles, if you have one in your lap, and, and look with me at verse 1 of chapter 3. And try to imagine if you were the prophet. Put yourself in his shoes. The Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Verse 2, if you can imagine this, Hosea says, So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. She was involved in what we would call today sex trafficking. She was on the streets, one man after another. Quite possibly, she was a cult prostitute working in the temple of Baal as one of those who serviced the so-called worshipers of Baal. So Hosea goes and finds her and pays what we read right here in this passage. This amount worth this because she was to be bought back. The ones who were selling her services were to be compensated. So Hosea buys her back and brings her home and marries her again. By going after her and taking her into off of the street and into the warmth and security of his home, he illustrates for the nation to witness their situation. Once restored to Hosea, Gomer was to leave her lifestyle of promiscuity. And she was to be his from then on, no longer in the arms of pagan lovers. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a twisted story, isn't it? In fact, it's difficult for us to read it because we have a hard time putting ourselves in his place. I ask you to do that only to enter into the story of Hosea. As I will end this message today with some application, this is a unique calling for this prophet. This is not God's will for every man with a faithless wife or for a woman with a faithless husband. So let's understand its purpose, what it is meant to mean and what it does not mean. What a unique, difficult calling for a prophet. I find that Hosea's obedience reveals two great truths. the depth of his devotion for Gomer. He loves her so much, he's willing to look beyond her lifestyle. The, the wickedness of her heart, the immorality of her life, to open his arms and bring her back, 
His devotion is, I would call, outrageous, just as it is persistent. The second great truth is his strength, his, com his commitment for the Lord his God. You know what's interesting? And I've looked. Not once does he balk at what the Lord commands him to do. He does it. He obeys. He sets out to find her, and he finds her. And when he finds her, he pays for her to be brought back. And who knows the conversation between the two of them and what that meant in the family. She had borne him children before she left, and she bore him children when she came back. Think of the struggle in the home with a mother like that. You see, written over both of those strengths, his obedience to the Lord and his love for his wife is unconditional love. I'll be honest with you, we see very little of it in our day. Unconditional love. You know what? A lack of understanding of that is what keeps some people away from the living God. They simply can't believe that a God that holy would be willing to take them in. You may be in that category. You may think, if you only knew the lifestyle of my past, if you only knew what I have done, the things I have allowed to happen in my life, the things I've even cooperated with, the wrong, the list of wrongs, I could tell you, you wouldn't have anything. Wait a minute. It's not about me. It's about the God who loves us unconditionally. God so loved the world. That quote I gave you early in my message, this mountainous message of the gospel is that he loves the world so much he gave his son for us. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, meaning all the sins of all the world piled on him at the cross. And he bore those sins on our behalf. And because of his act of righteousness, we are made whole before God. It's called justification. The sovereign act of God whereby he declares righteous the believing sinner while we are still in a sinning state. You get that? The sovereign act of God who loves us unconditionally whereby he declares us righteous when we believe, even though we still are sinful people. That's grace. And if you're holding back from coming to Christ, hoping someday to clean up your life, don't waste your time. You'll never clean it up enough to be as holy as God. Christ has done that for you. That's why I often quote the statement regarding uh, the Lord Jesus Christ that he loved us so much he died for us so that we don't have to die for our own sins. We can live in righteousness. The life that he lived qualifies us for the death he died. And the death that he died qualifies us for the life he lived. So Christ died bearing our sins and God receives us by his grace. Now back to the story. The first three chapters you can read for yourself and, and you can read the biography of Hosea and Gomer. 
how their marriage came back together against all odds. Like few marriages I could even imagine. Uh, I don't know that I've ever known a man to take a prostitute wife back into his home, buying her out of prostitution, out of love, and rebuilding a marriage with her. Perhaps it's happening or it's happened. I've just not been aware of it. That's how rare it is. I would venture to say it's almost more than any woman or man could imagine doing that with a former mate. Hosea does that. Now, all of that's in the first three chapters. Let me breeze through these last 11 because they are so disjointed. I'll give you an overview. He brings a case against Israel in chapters 4 and 5. Look at 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. And look at their lifestyle. There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God. You make vows, you break them, you kill, you steal, you commit adultery, violence, one murder after another. Dare I ask, does that sound a little familiar? Does that sound a little bit like our own nation? As far as we have drifted away from the God of our forefathers? Their, their nations were, their nation was an affluent nation but it was an immoral body of people who had long since left the teachings of the scriptures. And as a result, there is one assassination after another, one murder after another, one evil king after another, one false priest after another, so that the people become totally corrupt. So, Hosea urges them to return. That's in chapter 6, 7, and 8. As always, the Lord graciously left the door open for his people to come back to him. In chapter 6, verse 1, Hosea is pleading. He must have pled with Gomer the same way when he found her in the streets and urged her to return, so he does with the nation. Verse 3, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him, he pleads with the people of Israel. There's a lot of passion in those words. But Israel shuns him and ignores his pleading. By the way, all through your life you may have heard or maybe even used the words where we have sown the wind and reap the whirlwind. Let me show you where it's located in the Bible. Look at verse 7. Chapter 8, verse 7. In the New Living Translation, it reads, they have planted the wind and will harvest the whirlwind. By the way, that's what sin will do. You begin in a small way, and if you do not repent, if you do not turn to the Lord for forgiveness and, and recovery, it will only get worse. Sin never gets better. It never decreases on its own. It enlarges. I read uh, in one of the commentaries on Judges that when Samson was finally uh, captured by the implacable enemies of Israel, uh, and he was thrown into a dungeon. They gouged his eyes out. They chained him there, and he was uh, grinding out the grain in that, in, in that dungeon. And the commentator makes the comment how, illust how, how it illustrates sin. It, it, it blinds, it, it binds, and it grinds. It begins as wind, it leads to a whirlwind. 
ultimately to a storm in one's life. And so he says this of Israel. The chapter ends in divine judgment. Verse 14, Israel has forgotten its maker. Therefore, I will send down fire on the cities and will burn up their fortresses. This is a reference to the Assyrian invasion as Sennacherib and his troops would come in and Israel would fall to them, never to recover. In the last chapters, 9 through 14, turn to the judgment of God and the people's final, ultimate restoration when they will return to the God of their fathers in the millennium. So the wayward repent, and when they do, the righteous forgive, as God invariably does. I want to bring us to some application of this unusual story by pointing out four things that I think stand out, four lingering lessons, if you will. Here's the first, and it's about the nation itself. A nation declines rapidly when its priests and preachers become carnal and its people become corrupt. A nation declines rapidly when its priests and people, when its priests and preachers become carnal and the people become corrupt. People follow those who are the leaders. And uh, that's part of the heartbreaking situation in our own country today. Second uh, is about marriage. A marriage is strengthened by lasting love and frequent forgiveness. Hosea's continuous love for his wife and willingness to forgive her regardless became the secret of their being able to come back together. By the way, if you have trouble forgiving others, don't get married. Just, just don't go there. Don't, don't, no, don't, don't clap. That'll just <laughs> encourage it. Uh, you will find that because you are fallen in nature and your mate is a fallen person with nature, you have to forgive. I remember the, the interview between a younger person who was doing the interview with an older couple and they, they'd been married, I think, 60 plus years. And he wanted to know the secret of their marriage. And, and the wife said, well, we decided we would not argue. We, we would just walk away rather than argue. And he looked at the man and he said, is that true? And he said, yes, secret of our marriage is my love for the out of doors. <laughs> I've taken a lot of long walks. Uh, if you want your marriage to last, you, you better be good at forgiving. And your partner needs to be the same. As, as beautiful and lovely and wonderful and uh, thrilling as your wedding was, uh, you'll never be thinner and you'll never be nicer than you are at your wedding. From then on, the reality hits and forgiveness must take place. Uh, I'm, I am uh, so uh, grateful that God gives us the grace to love long-term and forgive regularly. Frequent forgiveness is part of the secret. Now let me get real serious. Third, God's plan is unique. Please hear this carefully. The plan he gave Hosea was his plan for Hosea. What he led Hosea to do is not his will for everyone else 
or for that matter, anyone else. It's written to and about Hosea. The message is to you, Hosea, you go and find Gomer and you bring her back. Why do I say that? Well, because the Lord has made allowance through unfaithfulness for an individual to break the bonds of the vows. An individual is free, is not obligated to hold it together if the partner is unfaithful. And I think there needs to be wisdom in this, and as you apply it, you need to understand there is a lifestyle of unfaithfulness. I've said on a number of occasions, you are not obligated to live with one who regularly is unfaithful to you. Hosea was obligated because it was his calling. This is a unique, I say again, a unique plan designed for the prophet Hosea. This brings me to a broader point I want to make on this third application. When you read your Bible, be careful about applying every single line of it to each part of your life. It may sound like heresy coming from a conservative preacher as I am, but uh, I think a perfect illustration is the individual who set his Bible by the window and let the wind blow the pages and he just picked out a verse and that became his verse for the day. He looked down and the verse he saw was, Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> well, that wasn't worthy of too much time. So he let the wind blow again and found another verse. And it said, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> and now panicked, he let that Bible blow more pages. And then he found, whatever you do, do quickly. So, the silly little illustration will help remind you, be careful about letting the wind point you to a verse here and a passage there and a half a verse there. Don't turn your mind off when you're reading your Bible. Be careful about making every line apply to every part of your life. Are you ready for this surprising statement? Some of it doesn't apply at all. What he said to Judas, he's not saying to you. A promise given to Israel is, is not a promise for all of God's people. A warning given to a nation is not a warning given to every nation. Use your head. Think. And as you read, you must read within the context of a passage. Just as you don't pick up a book and start on page 12 and then flip over to page 72 and then read a paragraph on page 104, you start at the beginning and you read it through and you keep the context in mind, just as the author wrote with context in mind. The best students of the Bible are students who understand context. So when you read Hosea, understand the uniqueness of this call. And if you're a counselor, be careful about using Hosea as the basis of your word to a person who's living with someone who is unfaithful. Along with being disciplined, be wise in your reading of the scriptures. So far, here we have it, a nation declines rapidly when its leaders become corrupt. Second, a marriage is strengthened by love and 
frequent forgiveness. Third, God's plan is unique for each one of us. Let me add one more thought here, and I'll move on. God's plan for you is not necessarily his plan for the one sitting near you or living by you. Be careful. Again, be wise. He may be leading you in a certain direction. It doesn't mean he leads someone else in that same direction. Be careful about open and closed doors. I'm sure Jonah, when he got on that ship and found a ticket was available to take him to Tarshish, he thought, oh, this is great, Lord's will, got a ticket to Tarshish, and I got a ship that'll take me there. Wrong. You're supposed to go to Nineveh. That's the opposite direction. Just because there's a ticket available doesn't mean you're to take it and go there. Think, be wise, read carefully, apply it with great care. Now the fourth I've hinted at earlier, so there's no reason to spend a great deal of time on this one. God's love is, is unconditional. Hear it again. Nothing you can do, no matter how good it may be, will cause him to love you more. No evil you have done will cause him to love you less. He's a God of grace. He doesn't receive us on the basis of works. He receives us on the basis of Christ's death. That's why the cross plays such a prominent role in our salvation. We don't come to our stack of works in order for God to look and be impressed and say, oh, well, that certainly outweighs your wrongs, so I'm going to accept you. Or this person with all the wrongs outweighing good, I can never accept you. No, it's on the basis of the cross where Christ paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I think it was Donald Barnhouse in Philadelphia who once said, aren't we glad the hymn doesn't say, Jesus paid 90%, 10% we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it light pink. Doesn't even rhyme. He takes our crimson list of sins and he washes that list white as snow, which means what? We're saved by grace, not by works. By grace you are saved through faith apart from works, lest anyone should boast. When we find ourselves in the glories of heaven, enjoying the blessings and benefits of our eternal home, not one of us will be able to parade our righteousness because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. We will be there by his grace. When I was at seminary, we used to have students that would compare their tests when they'd get them back in their, in, in their mailboxes. We took our tests in what were little blue books and, and there would be the grade put written on the front of the book. And uh, some would have made a, a B on, in this blue book, another one would have made a C. So they were busy comparing blue books. Well, what, what did you get for number four? Well, I wrote so-and-so. Well, I wrote the same thing and he marked mine wrong. I got a C and you got a B, that's not fair. There was a fellow in our class, 
he would pull his blue book out of the mail. He would just write grace across it, tuck it in his, in his briefcase and walk out. Whatever I got is grace. Whatever grade comes is grace. Let me tell you, whatever you get in life is grace. If you got what you deserve, we'd all be in a very, very hot place. All of us. But we get what Christ deserved for us. His blood cleanses us from all sin because God's love is unconditional. He's ready to accept you right now. Regardless of your past, regardless of your failures, just come as you are. Come as you are. Just as Gomer was free to come back to the one who loved her, you're free to come to the Lord your God who sent his son to die for you. Let's bow our heads. Will you do that with me, please? If there's never been a time in your life when you've received Christ, this is your moment right now. Don't put that off. Don't wait until an, another time. It may never come. You may be closer now than you'll ever be in your life to trusting in Christ. Trust him now. Simple prayer, Lord, I come just as I am. I'm a sinner. You're holy and I'm not. So I come to you seeking your forgiveness, your mercy, and the gift of eternal life. I accept it today by your grace. Gratefully, thank you for giving me Christ as my Savior. Connect with us, if you will, and we'll help you move on your journey as you make your way from earth to heaven. Thank you, Father, for the pleasure of your company during our worship together. Thank you for including a book, even one like Hosea, and for finding a prophet that faithful, that loving, that tender, to find room in his life for a woman who didn't deserve a man like that. Now give us discernment, our Father, as we walk with you in our lives. May we serve you faithfully and wisely. May we walk with you in knowledge and understanding. Guard us from mistaken principles and irresponsible applications. May we live a life that honors you and illustrates the truth of Scripture. Guard us from heresy in our walk with you. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior and our Lord. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.